Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Jessie Janelle Safumat, your host for today, and I'm excited to welcome you to the launch of Collapse and Recovery, a new flagship report from the Human Development Team at the World Bank. This report is very important. It digs deep into global data and shows that COVID-19 destroyed human capital among young people at alarming rates. So what is human capital, you may ask? It is the knowledge, the skills, the health that people invest in and accumulate throughout their lives, which helps them become productive members of society. So what were the impacts? What are the risks? And more importantly, what can be done about it? We are in for a very interesting discussion with our experts, and we'll look at how countries can rebuild lost human capital. We have a team of experts standing by to answer your questions in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic. They're working to answer as many as possible, so please drop your questions in the chat as we go along. You can post your questions at live.worldbank.org. So now I will be turning to Indermit Gill. He's the Chief Economist of the World Bank Group and Senior Vice President for Development Economics. I'm pleased to welcome him now for opening remarks. Sorry, stand by one second. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, Mamta, for the opportunity to introduce this important report. And I'm so sorry I couldn't attend in person. So three years into the COVID-19 pandemic, we are all so eager for a, even a bit of cheery news that we are tempted to take our eyes off a major oncoming danger. This report lays out that danger very clearly. The pandemic has done immense harm to our most important generation, people under the age of 25. This is a generation that will make up roughly 90% of the prime age working force by 2050. As the report notes, people in this group were knocked off course at a very critical time, at exactly the moment of their lives that determines the health and wealth they will get to enjoy over their lifetimes. So during the pandemic, more than a billion kids in low and middle income countries miss at least one year of in-person schooling. They also miss vaccinations, for example. Now, remote learning was better than nothing, but only barely. The data laid out in this report show that children learned very little during school closures. The result has been a major hit to global human capital. By one measure alone, the lifetime earnings potential of young people today, as much as 21 trillion may have been erased by learning losses. So we must be clear, restoring lasting prosperity will not be possible to do without prompt action to rebuild human capital. The innovation and prosperity gains that are necessary for faster growth cannot happen without greater human capital. And global efforts to tackle the challenges of climate change and aging societies across the world also cannot happen without greater human capital. Policymakers today are in the midst of an exceptionally difficult time. In a time of multiple emergencies, which fire should they put out first? The authors of this report have done a remarkable job in laying out useful policy options for developing countries. They show how the options can be prioritized and they spell out the cost estimates for each. So as you'll see over the next hour, there are solutions that are available. They might not be easy, but they will be effective if the hard work begins now. With that, Jesse, I'm going to turn this back to you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. 
Thank you, Indomit. Um, we have to start the hard work now to secure the, a better future for our youth and children. Alaka Hola and Joanna Silva are the lead authors of Collapse and Recovery. They are both senior economists here at the World Bank. And in this next short video, they will walk us through some of the report's key findings. Let's watch it together. We all know that COVID-19 was an enormous shock, but what you might not know is that the pandemic's impact on young people is a ticking time bomb. It threatens to reduce lifetime earnings and increase inequality for decades to come. COVID-19 knocked individuals off course at critical moments in their lives. Our report, Collapse and Recovery, looks at the impact this had and presents urgent actions needed to reverse the damage. The report focuses on human capital. That is the health, knowledge, and skills that people accumulate over their lifetimes. Often, it's the only asset poor people have, and it's what determines a person's productivity and earnings. So what was the pandemic's impact on young people? Let's begin with early childhood. It's a critical period for brain development, and it really lays the foundations for skills such as literacy and mathematics. Because of the pandemic, very young children miss essential vaccinations and stop going to preschool. There was also unprecedented stress in the families. The declines observed in cognitive and social-emotional development are alarming. For example, in Bangladesh, toddlers tested in 2022 lagged far behind in skills compared to toddlers tested in 2019. Why does this matter? We estimate that these declines will translate into a 25% reduction in earnings when these children are adults. A setback this large would have enormous impacts across societies. The pandemic also resulted in school closures everywhere. Over 1 billion children in low- and middle-income countries missed at least one year of in-person schooling. And despite enormous efforts in remote learning, the data show that kids did not learn during the closures. In fact, our estimates show that on average, each month of school closure led to one month of lost learning. For some students, losses were even greater, as many forgot things they had already learned. These learning losses are expected to reduce earnings around the world by $21 trillion. This will affect the well-being of millions of families worldwide. The last stage of the life cycle we study was youth. This is another crucial stage when people are making important decisions such as whether to stay in school, work or raise a family. COVID-19 led to dramatic drops in employment and a worse transition for young people into the labour market. We saw a substantial increase in the number of young people who were neither enrolled in school or training nor working. In Pakistan alone, the pandemic created 1.6 million additional idle youth. In several countries analyzed, there was little sign of recovery, even after 18 months. Being unemployed or holding a low-paying job when you first enter the labor market can result in scarring. Evidence suggests that this scarring can last up to 10 years. In all these stages, early childhood, school age and youth, the impacts of the pandemic were consistently worse for children from poorer backgrounds. These findings should worry all of us. People who were under the age of 25 when the pandemic hit will make up 90% of the prime age workforce of 2050. Faced with this true collapse in human capital, what can countries do? The good news is that there are evidence-proven strategies to recover these losses. Extending the coverage of pre-primary education and improving its content is a good example. It has shortened benefits, helping children become more prepared to learn. And over the long term, it has been shown to increase college attendance and earnings. It has even been shown to lower the propensity to commit crime. For school-aged children, simply having kids back in school will not be enough. How can a child who stopped going to school in second grade and stayed home for a year be expected to follow a fourth grade curriculum? It'll be important to match instruction to these students' levels of learning. Increasing instructional time and catch-up programs like tutoring can also reverse learning losses. Youth desperately need help for a good start in the labor market. For countries where youth employment has not recovered, 
training, entrepreneurship programs and apprenticeships are particularly important. All of these programs across all three life stages will not only address human capital losses, once you factor in increased individual earnings and tax revenues and a lowered need for social assistance, most of these programs end up paying for themselves. In some cases, to address specific losses in human capital, a health solution will be the most appropriate, while in others it might be an education or a social protection solution. But in most cases, we need solutions that bring these sectors together. When we step back and look at how systems responded during the crisis, we found that very few took integrated approaches. This has to change. It is nearly impossible to overstate the severity of COVID's impact on young people. It's not too late, however, to do something about it. But it is now or never. If we fail to act now, the losses documented in this report will become permanent. Together, we can meet this critical challenge. So let's get started. Let's get started. There's no doubt that the pandemic has had the devastating impacts on young people, and it's time for us to start now to secure their future. It's also good to hear about what countries can do, so we will soon have a panel of experts to discuss that more closely. In the meantime, remember you can share your thoughts on this topic using the hashtag invest in people. Please do follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn to keep the conversation going. At this time, we're also inviting you to take part in a special poll that you will see on the side of your screen. The question we're asking you is, what do you see as the greatest risk posed by this collapse in human capital? Please cast your vote right now at live.worldbank.org. Also, the report is available for download. If you want to know more details about it, please go ahead and download the report. Now we are being joined by Norbert Shadi. He's the Chief Economist for Human Development at the World Bank, and he will lead us in a discussion with three experts. Rukmini Banerjee, the CEO of Pratam Education Foundation, has widespread experience designing large-scale partnerships for improving learning outcomes in India. We have Robert Jenkins, the Global Director of Education and Adolescent Development at UNICEF, who has extensive program experience in Asia and Africa. And last but not least, we have Santiago Levy, a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings. At the Ministry of Finance in Mexico, Mr. Levy was the main architect of an incentive-based health, nutrition, and education program for the poor. Norbert, over to you for the panel. Thanks, Jesse. Um, that was really a, a wonderful way to kick off the event. I think that video is, is fabulous. It's a, it's a great way to summarize the main messages of the report. Um, so I'm very pleased to have that as an introduction. It also keeps me from having to summarize anything for anybody um, else. And we now have a, a wonderful panel uh, to, to, to uh, have a little discussion of, of some of the implications of, of the report. Um, and uh, just uh, to set the ground rules, I want to start by asking each of the panelists when I ask them a question to stick to, say, two minutes in your answers, just so we can actually have a lively discussion. Let me start by uh, sort of the motivation. And the motivation of the report is that the pandemic is uh, the largest global shock to human capital uh, in at least 50 years. Um, and yet, even though we know it has very serious implications for growth, for uh, distributional outcomes, for inequality, for wages, and so on, my sense is that it has dropped off a little bit in terms of the attention that policymakers um, are, are placing on it. Um, and so my question, and I want to start with uh, Santiago on this one. My question is, is what do you think we can do to make sure that policymakers sort of internalize some of the messages from this report, um, and really we can we can ensure that uh, this I think critical agenda uh, comes back uh, to the forefront um, of of these discussions and for the planned interventions that governments have. So over to you, Santiago. So good morning, and thank you, Norbert, and um, thank you for inviting me to this panel. Congratulations to Alaka, to Joanna, and to all the team at the World Bank who put together this great report. Um, coming to your question, Norbert, um, my sense is that 
two things are required. First, people need to really fully internalize the cost of what is happening. And I think this report goes a long way to do that. So dissemination of the report will be very important so people really understand. People have the vague idea, yeah, COVID was terrible, it was awful, it's over, let's move on. And I don't think it's clear in a lot of people's head, at least with my interaction with policymakers in Latin America, that in fact, no, COVID is not over. The pandemic is over, but the effects of COVID are not over. So this report can help a lot in actually making clear that the costs are still there. So that's point number one. Point number two, more important. These are not sunk costs. You can do something about it. And I think that's the critical thing that policymakers will pick up. If you just tell them, look, they're huge costs and that's that, then you know people just swallow hard and that's it, <laughs> huge costs. But if you say, look, they're huge costs, but it is not inevitable that you have to pay for them. And there are things that are doable that you can minimize those costs. So those two things together, I think I you know, begin to pave the way to an answer to what you properly put on the table, Norbert. I stop here. Thanks, Santiago. That was a great way to kick off uh, the discussion. In the report, we use the life cycle as an organizing framework uh, to analyze the costs uh, and to propose solutions, policy solutions for individuals of different ages. And we do this for a variety of reasons, but most importantly, because um, we believe that the uh, construction of human capital is a cumulative process. So what happens at one stage matters for what happens in the next stage. It's also multidimensional. So it's not as if we can really separate uh, uh, the policies or the effects of the pandemic and the policies to answer uh, these effects, for health, from education, from what happens in labor markets. Um, so for all of these reasons, we think this is a good organizing framework. So the next set of questions uh, for discussion are going to follow the life cycle. And I want to start with the youngest children, children uh, under the under the age of, uh, of five. Um, and, and as we show in the report, there are um, a variety of very serious costs that these children uh, face. Uh, there was disruption to critical services, uh, immunization, uh, preschools, uh, and so on. But there was also increases in um, uh, uh, problems with maternal uh, mental health, uh, food insecurity, and so on. And it seems that all of this has resulted in alarming losses in child development, losses that, if unaddressed, will follow these children and the, the, the economies for, for decades uh, to come. So, so I want to um, start with, with uh, Rugmini. So my sense here is that policymakers, insofar as they have internalized the cost of the pandemic, have focused more on school-aged children than they have on very young children. And so, Rukmini, is that your sense as well, uh, looking at India or, or elsewhere? And what do you think are some of the critical things we can do to reverse some of these very serious losses that we see amongst these young children? Uh, Norbert, I only know about India, so I can't talk about uh, other countries. But I would say in India, we see some very interesting developments. Our new education policy was uh, launched uh, right uh, in the middle of these pandemic years, in uh, uh, middle of 2020. And one of the key elements, are you able to hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. One of the key elements, I think, uh, most important elements of our new education policy is the focus given to what we are calling the foundational stage, age three to age eight. And this is the first time that as part of an education policy, the preschool age is given not only uh, extreme importance, but also seen as a continuum from the years that you start in preschool going all the way up to the early uh, grades in school. Now, you know, as you know, our schools and our preschools uh, were closed for almost two years. And really everything came back, uh, uh, you know, at least opened sometime you know, March, April of 2022. But even in the period since then, I would say that in the, for this age group, we see a lot of action. Uh, on the government side, we see that, you know, how do we really uh, strengthen the early uh, childhood education component is getting uh, attention across different states, both uh, for preschool classes, which are inside the government school system. Uh, some states have that but also how do we link to the preschool age group, which is currently in India under the uh, you know, Ministry of Women and Child Development. 
On the home front, while I completely agree with Alaka and uh, her co-authors about the huge disruptions at home, one of the things that we've seen during this period is an increased engagement at whatever education level families are, uh, or particularly of parents and mothers on trying to engage with learning. I would say parents always participated in sending kids to school. But because schools were closed, I think there was a greater uh, impetus. So, you know, I don't want to minimize the, the message of the report, which is absolutely right and critical to say we need to think about these things. But I would say that the focus on the early years, the continuum, the breadth of skills, and the importance of before children coming to first grade, what are the things that we can do? What are the, 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 the interventions that are becoming visible in India? I feel are very promising, at least for our children. That is fantastic. That's a really uh, encouraging news. And it's also just uh, uh, just fantastic, uh, fantastic points you made there. So let me turn to uh, to Rob. And I think a lot of attention insofar as there has been attention to what's happened to children before they enter formal schooling. A lot of attention has been devoted to the effects of preschool closures. Um, but we know that preschool has uh, very low rates of coverage, certainly in low-income countries. Even in middle-income countries, it's not very high in most middle-income countries, and certainly it's not very high amongst uh, disadvantaged uh, children. So my question to you, Rob, is I think in some sense we may know what to do uh, to remedy some of the losses for four- and five-year-olds, but are a little bit more at sea, if you want, for, about what to do for, say, zero to three-year-olds. And we know these kids have missed immunizations. We know their parents have uh, been through unprecedented levels of stress because of the pandemic. We know, as we saw in the evidence from Bangladesh, that their cognitive and other development has gone down alarmingly. So my question to you is, what do you think we should do for these very young children, zero to two? Uh, what would you give particular priority to um, in, in, in order to recover some of these losses, which we know have very serious consequences thereafter? <coughs> it's a great question, Norbert. Thanks so much. And it's great to be jo um, to join Santiago and Rukmini on this panel. And just let me also add my congratulations to your friends and colleagues at the World Bank for producing such an amazing piece of analytical work. And, and I'm sure it will be proved very useful. And UNICEF will, will continue to work so closely with the World Bank in rolling it out and engaging with our partners and friends and governments around the world to implement those um, very well thought out and evidence-based recommendations. So Norby, your question is, is really important, and I think it's in, um, important particularly because from a political point of view, it's often the youngest children, I think, that their voice is maybe most distant from policy tables. And so it's really important for us to recognize um, that we all need to collectively see the evidence, which is so overwhelmingly positive on the return on investment in programming and policies which reach young children, enable them to then transition into more formalized schooling, school ready. So what the, some key uh, concrete recommendations are that we're, that we're seeing many countries develop it and, and roll out, but not enough sufficiently, particularly reaching the most marginalized children. Though, but those key interventions are, one, take a holistic approach to a young child. I think we all recognize that if you only focus on, say, the immunization status of a child or nutritional well-being or psychosocial stimulation by supporting parents, um, you will you will fail if you only look at one of these vertical interventions. We really need to look holistically and work together across ministries from a holistic point of view for, for children, particularly youngest children, um, because in a sense, we only sort of will benefit if all needs of, of a young child are met. And then with that collaboration across ministries and with communities and working closely with parents, we need to also, and the report is very clear on, uh, recognize the disproportionate impact COVID has had and um, the increased marginalization of already vulnerable children and young, and young children in particular. So we need to proactively allocate additional public resources and additional um, global resources to reaching the most marginalized young children. Now, who those most marginalized children are will depend on each context, but they they do um, have common 
characteristics. They tend to be uh, children that live in remote locations. They tend to be children that are living in predominantly higher poverty areas all over the world. They tend to be in um, populations which are often uh, in minority or different backgrounds. Um, so these are uh, characteristics which, when analyzed locally, enable us to then recognize the marginalized uh, dimension of, of each context, and then we can prioritize efficiently. So the two overwhelming um, sort of points I'd put on the table just to summarize is holistic, comprehensive support to youngest children, recognizing the return on investment is so positive, and, a prior and to prioritize the most marginalized, which um, needs some analysis in each context, but has common uh, characteristics. Thanks, Rob. That was wonderful. So to close uh, on ECD, uh, let me turn once again to, to Santiago. Santiago, you you held uh, various uh, 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 important positions in the Ministry of Finance in in uh, in Mexico, and you uh, launched what was at the time and, and continues to be one of the most innovative uh, programs, uh, social programs ever, the the Progresa program, uh, which gave conditional cash transfers to uh, poor families in in, in Mexico. So with your sort of background in public policy, my sense is that part of the reason why young children uh, or policies for young children get less interest than some of the policies either for uh, school-age children or young adults is the fact that we do not regularly measure their development. We measure stunting. We measure what happens to school-age children. We measure enrollment. More recently, we measure uh, testing outcomes for these young children, but we have not consistently measured what happens uh, to young children. And this was even more the case during the pandemic, so there wasn't really even a baseline that we could compare uh, in general, that we could compare uh, what was happening to children with what how they were developing before. So first, do you think this is true? Do you, is your sense that the fact that there is very little data uh, on, on this uh, sort of affects the policies that governments put in place, including those that the Ministry of Finance uh, thinks highly of? And if so, do you think it really should be a very high priority to collect these data? One thing that we advocate very strongly in the report is that data is critical. Data is critical to make informed decisions. And data is very often lacking, and it's certainly lacking for this age group. So let me stop there, Santiago, and uh, please share your reflections on this. Thank you. So my reading of things, and again, this is a, a view based on, on my experience in Latin America, I really can't talk about other regions of the world, is that more than data, up until at least 10 years ago, the fundamental issue with early child development was awareness. Awareness that that was really important. You spoke about the time in which Progresa was designed. This is about 25 years ago. We were ignorant that early child development was very important. We thought it was mostly an issue of nutrition, of mother's health, and then of schooling. But schooling thought of us from six years onwards. So we were ignorant that the fact that this earlier period is truly important. Awareness of that has changed over the last 10 years. I think now my sense is most governments in the region are clear that early child development matters a lot. What I think we still are not there is Look, this is the set of interventions that can actually help. There is some work that has been done, you know this work, Norbert, by Horacio Tanasio in Colombia and by other people that say pirating visits and these options are there, but we still haven't found kind of like the package option that you could probably tag on to a CCT in a way that is cost effective and we could then build more and, and really take the early child development more systematically. There, sort of scattered efforts. What we need is a more systematic, large-scale effort. As part of that systematic, large-scale effort, data follows. If we just think about pulling together data without packaging with some interventions, my, my sense is that most finance ministers will say, look, this is an academic undertaking. I have no time for this. I have no money for this. If you just want to collect data so you can write papers, no. However, if I'm now putting 0.1 or 0.2 of GDP into strengthening my CCT with a very well-designed early child development in intervention, yes, then I really want to get data to make sure that my money is being well spent. So I, I, I don't want to sound cynical, 
but I want to say we've got to create the incentives, particularly in the finance ministry and in the planning ministries, for them to invest in gathering data and for them to see that this is not only an academic exercise, but is really central for the money that they're going to put. And the region is advancing in that direction. Uh, this report can actually help to advance a little bit more by saying, look, you lost a lot, and this is the time in which you can put together some interventions, and these interventions are on the table and, you know, launched. Um, stop here. Uh, thank you, Santiago. Um, so let me move on to the next uh, stage of the life cycle uh, that we cover in the report, which is school-age children. Um, school-age children, I mean, some of these figures are, are really astounding. Uh, roughly one billion, that's not million, one billion children in developing countries were out of school for a year or more. This is really kind of shocking. And moreover, we find that these children who were out of school learned very little, if anything, uh, while they were out of school, despite widespread efforts by governments to um, provide various forms of distance uh, learning. So, so let me let me start with Rob. Uh, Rob, I know that uh, UNICEF in general and you personally have spent a great deal of time reflecting on this. So, so what do you think went wrong? And what do you think, if you had to name just one policy priority that governments should follow to remedy some of these learning losses, just one, what would it be? I know it's tough to just focus on one, but really what went wrong and what can we do now? So the interesting thing, Norbert, is it didn't go wrong everywhere. It went wrong in certain countries compared to other countries. Um, and there were many countries that did their utmost to keep schools open, to proactively provide uh, remote learning opportunities, to prioritize marginalized children. And other countries did not, and other decision makers did not. So also it's time for us to further reflect on what, why did some countries enact in such different way than other in other countries. But over, overall, I think we in we globally, collectively, all those of us that work in education did not sufficiently prioritize in education and, and outside of education, but did not sufficiently prioritize um, keeping schools open and ensuring um, that children continue to learn. And I think we underestimated the impact of school closures, not only on learning, but on the broader mental health, psychosocial support and other needs of children. And it was um, a little bit too little too late in many countries. And now we're very much playing catch up. Um, and that indeed is a very challenging situation to be in. Um, so the one recommendation moving forward. Well, the World Bank and, and ourselves and UNICEF and working with other uh, organizations have issued a, a number of uh, reports and guidance following the RAPID framework. So I would encourage um, adopting that. We see some countries are moving forward with this. RAPID is an acronym that outlines some key policy actions, but all of that ultimately comes down to um, as children are entering back into school, as the report that's being released just now um, from the excellent work being done at the World Bank is, 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 is also saying, as children are now returning back to school because of the learning loss that has taken place, as you mentioned, Norbert, it is time for us now to provide um, holistic support as children walk in, back into the classroom, accelerated programs but recognize also that requires mental health, psychosocial support, a sense of safety so that marginalized children can be successful. And we do our utmost collectively to enable children to catch up. Um, that will require us also to proactively bridge children that um, either have been absent from school or have dropped out back into school. So proactively bridging kids back in school and meeting their holistic needs to enable them to catch up. Thanks, Rob. And um, I, I agree. I mean, I find it very puzzling. First of all, the, the big regional variation in the length of school closures with Latin America and South Asia having much longer school closures than other developing country regions. Um, but also within regions, just wild heterogeneity in how long schools were closed. And it doesn't correlate with either GDP or administrative capacity or even the spread of the virus. So it's really quite, I think it is something that we could learn a lot from. Rukmini, I, I think... Uh, Probably more than anybody on this call, I, I can hazard to say this, you have spent time thinking about what school-age children, young children need. 
um, including as, uh, on how best to recover these learning losses um, from the pandemic. So what are your thoughts on what we need to do now? Again, uh, if we can all sort of stick to about two minutes, that'd be great because I've, I've just been told we're, we're gradually running out of time. So go ahead, Rukmini, please. So you asked Rob for one, uh, but since I'm going, to, I'm going to give you two. Um, I think two things, very very broadly speaking, for our early children, the children who actually during the last two years didn't even get an opportunity to go to school, first graders, second graders, we need to start them really well. Uh, there's a wealth of knowledge that you have all put out, or including in your report. So I would say first priority is get ready for leaping forward. Starting well and leaping forward for the early grades. There are lots of things that we now know that we can do better than we've done in the past. And the second one, clearly, as Rob said, is catch up. It's really, you know, schools have been closed for different periods of time. And to me, the most important thing is what you do when schools open. And if I look at the data, for example, from India, we just released uh, last month, just about a month ago, our annual status of education report which is able to compare data from 2022 with you know, 10, 15 years before. Remember that we are in a situation where the COVID landed on a trend that was not uh, uh, you know, very uh, satisfying uh, anyway. So there was, uh, you know, the World Bank brought out, I think in 2018, the WDR, which focused on the learning crisis. If I look at our own data in India from 2012 to 22, you know, the, the percentage of kids in third grade who were able to read basic text, do arithmetic, was somewhere just under 30%. It rose a little bit, little bit every couple of years, but it rose only a little bit. And then along comes COVID and there's a drop. But think about third graders who had actually not really been to school. You know, two years they were at home and then they've come back. And to me, at least the surprise was that the loss wasn't more. So today, at least to, not today, to the 2022 around September, we have learning levels which are lower than 2018. But I'm surprised that actually kids had some learning even though schools were closed, which means that around them, there were things going on that helped. So very important that don't do what you were doing before. The world is a different place. And the trends, at least in our country, show that while there was incremental change, we need a much bigger jump. The heterogeneity within classrooms has increased. So the way you were teaching before uh, is not going to work. And my one plea to anybody who's listening, at least in countries like ours, is put aside the linear uh, age grade curriculum for a little while. Focus on the basics that give us strength, basic reading, basic math. These are low hanging fruit in some cases. Children will progress quickly if you start at their own level. I have to make a plug for teaching at the right level. We've been working on that for you know 20 years. And you can see that if you do that, you may come back to a better place than you were before COVID. That is uh, su such a great answer. I, I love the, the recommendation to get ready to leap forward. I mean, this is really, I think uh, we, we should have adopted that uh, right away for the report and maybe we'll, we'll take it on. If not for the report, uh, we'll take it on at least for the dis dissemination. So let me turn to the last stage of the li life cycle that we um, analyze in the report, and that is young people. Young youth is a, is a very critical stage in the sense that it is the moment at which individuals go from mainly accumulating human capital to using that human capital in the labor market. And we know that the pandemic had very serious effects uh, on youth and in particular on the transition into the labor market. What's interesting to me here, again, many things are interesting, but what, what I find particularly striking is how different uh, the results were for different countries. We did a lot of very careful analytical work on this for the report, and we find that some countries, uh, including Mexico, um, is in Brazil, are countries where there was a very serious shock initially, but those countries, the labor market, the outcomes for youth as well as adults have largely recovered. Then we find another group of countries where basically there's no recovery of either adult or youth employment as of at least uh, late uh, 2021, and, and South Africa is, is one example of that. And then we find another group of countries where adult employment has recovered, but youth employment um, has not. We think that this is an, an, a useful framework to think about the kinds of policies that should be designed, understanding 
where, what kind of employment um, has recovered. And so I want to start with Santiago on that. Santiago, is uh, what do you think might account? Uh, you know, just I know you we can't go into the details of every country, but there really is this very very uh, large heterogeneity across countries. So what might account for some of these differences, and what do you think are the policy implications of that? Um, I, I will focus a lot on the short run heterogeneity because. There's a lot of macro factors behind there. There's a lot of very idiosyncratic elements of individual countries, whether they, you know, they did countercyclical spending or they did not do countercyclical spending, whether the exchange rate went up and down, whether the, there's a lot happening aside from the COVID shock in the very short run on the macro side, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, international interest rates are going up. So there's a lot happening and there's a lot of noise and that probably generates a lot of heterogeneity combined with individual country policy responses on the macro side. I think what your report points out is something deeper and more profound and more important, which is to say, look, it is likely that a lot of these youth are going to be entering the labor market with less human capital than before. Maybe we can do something remedial before, but let's face it, this was a huge shock. So we need to rethink labor market policies. And paradoxically, Norbert, here, there's a lot of room for improvement. The paradox is this, labor markets, at least in Latin America, are so dysfunctional, they work so badly, they're so terribly regulated, that the room for improvement is very large. And I'm not talking about what Joanna was saying about apprenticeship programs and all that. You can do that. I'm talking about something more systemic. We regulate the labor markets in ways that actually tax formal employment, subsidize informal employment. If you think about what determines whether a youth that is going to be hurt with, from COVID is going to be employed or not, yeah, there's his individual human capital that is now less than before. But it also depends on what set of firms are out there and what is the cost of hiring under different modalities. And we can change that with policies. This is not hysteresis from COVID. This is are we subsidizing small, inefficient, you know, informal firms with microcredits and all that? Or are we trying to promote larger formal firms that can invest in their workers, do on-the-job learning, do on-the-job training, and change their trajectories? So my sense is from the policy side, your report can say, look, all these individuals that are adolescent now, it's difficult that they're going to go back to school. They're going to enter the labor market with less human capital than before. You've got to rethink the structure of the labor market and rethink the structure of social insurance. And here, the opportunities in Latin America are vast. And double gain. Not only would you help this youth, but improving the functioning of the labor market is probably the single most important thing that could be done to reduce inequality and to promote growth in Latin America. So one suggestion here, my player, Rukmini may make hers, I'll make mine. Please use your report as a platform for telling governments, you've got to rethink the labor market because the people that are entering the newer cohorts, unfortunately, are going to be with less human capital than what we thought. And you've got to change the structure of barriers, incentives, and taxes for these things to work much better. Stop here. Uh, thanks, Santiago. So I, I've just been advised, um, not for the first time, that our time is uh, running out. Um, I could stay here for another uh, two hours and discuss uh, with you all, and I'm sure we would have come up with uh, all kinds of interesting ideas. But uh, uh, let me have the last question to each of the three um, panelists. And it's as follows. You know, one of the things we talk about in the report is that in addition to in, uh, the failures that happened for individual policies, if you want, something in education, not opening schools early enough or not doing X, Y, and Z, there were these broader systemic failures. There were these broader systemic failures that reflected that countries were not ready, were not prepared for a shock uh, like this. And we believe, taking evidence from a variety of settings, that countries could be better prepared and that countries that prepare better do better. For example, the countries uh, in which the Ebola epidemic hit in West Africa were better prepared uh, uh, for this shock than other countries of similar income levels, for example. So 
to each of you, beginning with uh, uh, Rob, uh, what is one thing that you might, and this, you know, maybe take a minute and, and no more, or, or I'll get into trouble here. What is one thing that you think should be a priority in terms of these larger sort of systemic issues um, and how to address them moving forward? Or do you even think that they're particularly important? I think the one uh, word I would give um, as a way forward is dynamic. And what I mean by that are those countries that were able to weather the challenge of COVID. And, and unfortunately, I think it's we would all be predicting future challenges coming from the impact of climate change and other challenges. Um, those countries that were more dynamic, meaning had multiple learning pathways for children, to, it had multiple tools to enable children to, to learn, children at all different ages could pivot very quickly from one methodology to another um, modality of learning, they fare better, better. So countries that are more dynamic in their delivery of education systems and delivering of learning opportunities Fare better and uh, fare better in challenging and more, and I, unfortunately, I think in increasingly challenging situations that are, are to come. So that's my one overall message I'd give Norbert. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it's very helpful. Thank you, Rob. Let me turn then uh, to Santiago on this, and, and I'll close with Rukmini. Uh, if I put it into one word, is prepare now by changing your social insurance systems. The reason the shock was so costly was in part because you did not have insurance. We've made many mistakes in social protection in Latin America. We've tried to substitute income transfers for insurance. There are different things. Insurance has to do with shocks. There'll be new shocks in the future, inevitably. We don't know what. Something will come up. It is much better to provide insurance ex ante and minimize the impact of the shock than to provide income transfers ex post it is better than nothing, and I'm glad some countries in the region did it, but we should learn from this, and the big lesson is you cannot substitute for a well-functioning social insurance system, and what you have constructed over the last two decades is not that. And again, your report could be a platform to begin to move the needle on that dimension. Thanks, Santiago. Rukmini, you get the, the final word uh, before I close. Uh, I think you're on mute, uh, Rukmini, because I can't hear you. So I would say that, you know, our education systems, our health systems, and maybe our social protection systems often are quite centralized, where decisions have been quite high up, and then it takes time for benefits to flow below. I think what the pandemic showed us is decentralized decision making can be very, very helpful, particularly in addressing the dynamism that Rob, uh, Rob is talking about. Uh, there were places uh, in, in in countries in uh, within countries that were much less affected, where if locally there was a robust decision making process which had been in place before, you perhaps could have dealt with some of these shocks. Mm -hmm. And the last one I would say is, you know, trust human beings. The trust between different groups of people, parents, teachers, principals. If you trusted each other before COVID. I think the 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 you know difficulties were easier to deal with, but if there was again silos in which sort of so-called stakeholders operated, uh, then during a time of crisis, it's very difficult to come together. That's exactly right, and that's what we say in the report as well. Sort of trying to invent things on the fly when the crisis has already hit is extremely uh, difficult and doesn't work very well. Um, I read an article in the New York Times yesterday where Jared Diamond uh, was talking about Finland, which I thought was very interesting. Finland has had a standing committee to deal with crisis since World War II. And this is high level people in the government. And they meet every month to game out a particular crisis that could hit uh, Finland. So it could be complete uh, uh, no energy at all for a few days, or it could be a new pandemic. And as a result, when the pandemic hit, Finland seemed to be much better prepared than some other countries. So this is a case where we really don't want to be in a, in a cycle of what health experts call uh, panic and then neglect. Panic when something hits and then neglect uh, for the next 10 years thereafter. So investments ex ante are, are I think, very, very important. So thank you very, very much to the three panelists. This has been a fabulous discussion. My only regret is that it can't go on for longer. Um, but I now want to turn uh, back to uh, to Jesse to guide us through the last uh, part of the, of the discussion. But thank you very much to everybody. And uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, listening in as well. 
Thank you so much, Norbert, and thank you to our panelists for sharing your experiences from different parts of the world. In the words of Santiago Levy, the pandemic is over, but the effects of COVID-19 are not. So may it be in physical and mental health, early childhood education, education overall, access to jobs, these are real effects that will impact the future generations if we don't look at it more closely. Mapta Murti is the Vice President for Human Development at the World Bank. She's been listening with the rest of us, and I would like to invite her to share her insights and closing remarks with us now. Um, thank you very much, Jesse. Uh, and let me begin by thanking our fantastic panelists, uh, Rob, Rob uh, Rukmini and, and Santiago, for what has been a very illuminating discussion. Um, I also want to uh, say a few words uh, of thanks to Norbert. He's been very modest through this discussion. Norbert is the father, if you like, uh, of, of this report on the on collapse and recovery and, and really is owed a lot of credit for, for pulling it together. Um, and of course, uh, uh, I want to thank our, our fantastic, uh, um, uh, the work, fantastic work done by Joanna and, and Alaka. Um, it's hard to conclude uh, this discussion. Uh, it's been sobering on the one hand. I think the evidence presented on the setback to human capital has been truly sobering. Uh, um, we've, we've heard about the, the losses to human capital, which affect nearly 90% of the, the cohort, uh, the workforce of, of 2050. This is going to have significant implications for growth, economic growth, if not remedied. We also know the setbacks to human capital have been the most severe in uh, amongst low-income households. So we can we can for foretell uh, an impact on inequality, a growth in inequality if 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 these setbacks are not remedied. Um, and you know it goes without saying that many of the things that as an international community we we hold uh, 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 dear, um, like the SDGs, are going to be very hard to attain with these setbacks. Um, we, we all know that COVID-19 led to tragic loss of life. We know the imp economic impacts were severe, but we're not talking enough about the setbacks to human capital. So, so uh, at the World Bank, we're calling this a silent crisis. And the purpose of this report, um, this event, and then follow on events, dissemination, engagement with, with, with partners and others is really to make this silent crisis um, a crisis that everybody knows about. Now, um, that's the sobering part. We also had a very illuminating conversation about what can be done. And, and, and that's, the, that's what I want to focus on for, for the remainder of, of the time that I have. Um, there are lots of things that can be done, and, and some of them have already started. We heard some very good examples from, from Rukmini um, uh, uh, about what's happening in India. Um, and we also know that uh, uh, we also know that this is just the start of a conversation. Uh, that that things that are happening all over the world can also be exchanged, and 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 uh, countries can learn from each other. Um, what I would like to say is that we we have to start now. Uh, as I said, things have started already, but where they have not started, really now is the time to begin because. Uh, accumulation of human capital is, is cumulative. And, and um, if things don't get remedied early, the divergences just become huge. Um, now, in order to, uh, in order to, um, uh, to have an impact, I think we have to work in partnership. And I really very much look forward to working with everybody on this call and, and others who may listen to this. Um, uh, I very much look forward to working in partnership to begin to put in place some of the measures um, uh, that are needed. What would we do as the World Bank? I see ourselves as doing three things. Um, first of all, I think we, we play a role in raising awareness, in, in informed advocacy. And this is something that we will continue to do. Um, the second thing I see us doing is uh, doing uh, analysis. This report is a good example of the kind of analysis that we do. Um, we're doing uh, a lot of this. Uh, many uh, the, the panelists, uh, Rukmini, Rob, uh, you spoke about dynamic systems, dynamic response. Um, in World Bank speak, we call it resilient systems and, and resilient response. And we're doing a lot of work on what 
would constitute a resilient system? What are some of the elements of building resilience, whether it's in, in the delivery of education, whether uh, it's the delivery of healthcare or, or, or social protection? Santiago, you had some interesting ideas there. So we're doing a lot of this work on resilience and, and we hope to do, we hope to do more of it. And um, finally, we're a development uh, bank. We also are stepping up our financial support. Uh, uh, it's actually gone up significantly uh, as uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the financial support that we provide in education has has doubled. In in healthcare, it's gone up by two and a half times, and in social protection, it's trebled. Um, and and so this is something that we we commit to com- commit to doing um, to support countries to build the resi- resilient systems that they need. Um, I think I can end um, uh, with no better words than uh, um, than what uh, Rukmini had. Uh, I wrote down. I should end by saying, "Let's get this done." But I think I'm going to steal from uh, Rukmini's playbook and say, uh, "Let's work together um, uh, to to recover to to leap forward." Uh, let's let's work together to leap forward. With, with that, let me hand it back to you, Jesse. Thank you, Mamta. I'm going to steal these words too. Let's work together to leap forward. And I thank our panelists, uh, our experts in the chat as well for this insightful conversation. Um, awareness is key, so please download the report, the Collapse and Recovery Report, and share it to your peers and your networks. Uh, let's continue the conversation on social media using our hashtag invest in people. We hope you enjoyed hearing from all our panelists today. And so with that, we wish you a very great day today. Bye.